Welcome to The Truth in This Art, your source for conversations on arts and culture. I'm your host, Rob Lee. And today, I am honored to be in conversation with my next guest, an award-winning contemporary artist, the author of the Rogue Artist Survival Guide, which is a part of the Rogue Artist series. This book offers an honest and unconventional approach to demystifying marketing for artists. Through his own journey, he provides the tools and the mindset to navigate the art world and create a successful career. Please join me in welcoming Rafi Perez. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you. Thank you. This is awesome. I've, I've, so far, I've had an amazing time talking to you. We should have recorded it. All. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, that would have been great. Um, but it, it's here. It's here and it's here. That's um, right. So so thank you so much for, for agreeing to pop on and, and chat with me. And, you know, as I said, um, on the, in the onset, there's like a nice chunk of about 50 episodes where it's fingerprints, <laughs> it's references to your work that just pop up in there, your your book that just pop up in conversation. So I've been stealing from you. So there you go. I mean, it's fine because, you know, I've listened, I've listened to the podcast and uh, you've made it your own. So that's all you, man. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, so one of the things when I do these interviews that I'm very, very interested in, um, I'm interested in like, what creatives, what artists do in the day, sort of those rituals and those routines. And I'm also interested in sort of their origin story. Like, how did you get there? You know, like, since you, you, you met it, you admitted earlier before we started, you're a bit of a bit of a geek, bit of a nerd, such as I am. And yep. you hear about the villain origin story. I want to hear about the creative origin story for you. <laughs> so the creative origin story uh, for me starts off as a kid. So I was awkward, shy, introverted. And I spent a lot of time um, with a sketchbook or drawing or playing, you know, creating little things with clay. And um, I was a kid. My So I come from a Cuban family, They're very loud, very rambunctious, you know, um, anybody that knows Cubans, it's like you get Cubans and Italians in the same room and it's just, you know, nobody, nobody could hear each other speak. I wasn't like that. I was, I was like this little quiet, you know, so I was the kid in the family that everybody was like, something's wrong with that one, you know, <laughs> because I was, you know, I was creative and stuff, but I was also painfully shy. And so I spent a lot of time just drawing or creating or, or doing stuff like that. So that's where, that's where that passion comes from, you know? And I think, I think really at the core of it, a lot of creativity comes from that lonely place, mm. you know, not saying that you have to be an introvert to be creative or anything like that, because I know plenty of uh, people that consider themselves extroverts that are creative. Now that whole thing too, like, I, I don't think that there is a defining thing for anybody. I think that's just a label. Sure. Like we have areas in our life where we can be more, more outgoing and we have areas where we're a little bit more secluded. But I spent a lot of time doing that and it became my escape in life, right? Here's the sad part of that. It becomes your escape in life as you try to traverse life and do what everybody else is telling you to do, like get a job, go to school, do this thing, you know, oh, I want to be an artist. What do you mean you're going to be an artist? You're never going to make any money with it. <laughs> like, you know, get a real job, all that stuff. Um but that seed of passion, and I think that we all have that seed of passion for something, whether it is painting, whether it is writing, whether it is, I mean, it doesn't even have to be one thing. It's just the the process of creating something, right? Yeah. It could be a podcast recording. It could be videos on YouTube. It could be anything, right? As long as you are creating something and it has some kind of meaning to you, where you have created something tangible that you could either listen back, watch back, look at you know, something. Yeah. And I think we all have that. And a lot of us then replace that with meaning given to you by, well, if I get this job and my family approve of what I'm doing, then that's my meaning. And a lot of people identify with that. Right. Mm -hmm. So immediately you become your job, right? 
what do you, who are you? What do you do? Immediately you're like, well, you know, I do this for a living and I blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and, and the, the higher the, the name, you know, well, I, I'm a manager for whatever. I'm a district manager for this. You know, all of a sudden you've got that label, that, that name that's attached to that. And I think we all identify with something like that. And it's easy to lose track of the real meaning of who you are. And that's what ended up happening to me. I ended up going into corporate. Mm -hmm. I ended up, you know, I was a, I was a big deal in corporate, (laughs) a big deal to myself and my coworkers. Right. But at the end of the day, you lose your job (laughs) and you lose that meaning Mm -hmm. that you've spent all that time identifying with. Right. And what do you have left? You know, And for me, really, it was understanding that like this creativity thing, this art thing has been the constant in my life. And it started as a kid. It's just always been there. It's like a close friend that's always been there. And, you know, and the funny thing is that when it comes to all of that, right, it was just something that I, because a lot of people talk about talent. So just to dispel the myth of talent, right? (laughs) We're all talented. The difference is I was drawing and sketching since I was like four or five years old. So by the time I was 12, I had years of experience, right? It wasn't because I was a savant. It was because I've been drawing forever. Right. For, you know, whatever reason. And I think that that's really the the thing about it is like when you have a passion for something, for whatever reason, when you feel passionate about something, you do it often. And if you do something often enough, you do it well. And then that's where the recognition comes in. But there's a lot of words like that, like talent and all that stuff being thrown around. And really, at the end of the day, it's like, how much are you doing it? It's it's this thing where in and I, it's so many things that you said there in that beginning. And thank you because I relate to it on so many levels where, you know, having that job and really closely relating to it. Oh, I'm a marketing analyst for a Fortune 250 company. You know, huh? Yep. And then when I got like, you know, the axe and, you know, I just had to really reevaluate who I was as the individual and went to a depression because, you know, I was always trying to do the thing. I, I call it, you'll, you'll like this. I think I call it the greatest hits, you know, yeah. Nah, artists, why would you want to do that? You never make any money doing that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the greatest hits. And I, I remember when I was younger, when I was like a kid and they still have some of the art books, it was like, I was really into comics and I wanted to be a comic book artist. That's yeah. what the thing was. And, you know, that didn't really, you know, work out for whatever reason. Um, and in, in high school, I kind of started pursuing writing, creative writing, poetry, things of that nature, and also rapping. That's different podcast, different story. Uh, none of it was good. But I mean, I'm, I'm you know, more practice. <laughs> I did it regularly. You know, it, was, it was a thing. It was just like, hmm, going by this alias, a lot of clothing here, my sponsor. So, so, so doing that, and I, I will say, you know, with where I'm at, you know, professionally, I suppose right now and being able to sort of balance both. It's it's a tenuous balance, but balance both. I I'm 38 now, just turned 38 last month, and I'm 14 years in podcasting and 15 years into this sort of data professional like lifestyle right. that I'm, I'm living. And I'll see it like about 24 or around my birthday, actually. I was like, I need to do something creative because this job is not creative. It's marketing analysts. It's not like creative yeah. marketing or anything along those lines. And within a month, it was like, I'm going to Best Buy to buy audio gear. I was like, I can do this. And I was in this spot of thinking, the only talent I have is maybe being into some weird stuff and having conversations and doing storytelling around that. And really crafting a sort of lane and niche a niche for it before a lot of this was even a thing. Right. Right. And, you know, really doing it. Like if I were to do a handful, like right now, this podcast, the truth in this art, I've done probably 600 and wow. I've done other podcasts that were around three to 400. So it's like, you know, over a thousand that I've done. And it's like, Oh, this is, this is why I can do this. And I feel a certain way about it. And I feel the sort of origin story, I feel that sort of similarity and attraction there. Yeah. 
Yeah, because that's and that's really the reality of it. It's the the reason that I say it. Like you gotta anybody could do anything, right? But you gotta persist through the bullshit. Mm-hmm. And the bullshit is gonna be people around you don't believe in you. People don't think that it's possible. You don't think that it's possible. You don't believe in you. Um, you know, every roadblock that you're going to throw at yourself, you're going to throw at yourself, whether it's, uh, you know, needing the validation of others and mm-hmm. understanding finally, you know, you do it enough times and you get to a point where you realize I don't need anybody's validation. Yeah. I don't, I don't, you know, like what I'm, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Well, how much money are you making? Well, what who fucking cares like more i'm greatest dude, hits. yeah more greatest exactly hits. <laughs> exactly so it's like it's and it's it's one of those things that like when you're in it and you've been doing it and you've done 600 podcast you know like i would i would have never have thought when i started doing uh youtube videos that right now on our channel we have like 400 youtube videos on one channel and like 200 on another and whatever and it's like random crap yeah. But it's this thing where it's like, I'm going to create as much as I can create while this is what I do, because I spent the vast majority of my life working a job for someone else and making excuses for not doing what I do. So like people ask me, like, how are you so prolific? You know, I've I've created and sold thousands of paintings yeah um my my wife has created and sold thousands of pieces of jewelry we have a band we had to have records that we've distributed out there i've got books that i've put out there you know videos we we record podcasts of us just sitting there talking and all of it is a creation you know what I mean? All of it is a creation. It's not it, It's not this thing where it's like, well, if he's an artist, then he paints or he sketches or he uses watercolor or he does this or he does that. No, if you're an artist, you write, you, you know, whatever it is that that series of creation. And I think, you know, I, I had said earlier that I was really quiet, introverted, shy. The reality is that when it the the motivation that has kept me going over this decade where you know out of nothing we created this weird awesome life that we're living as artists as creators yeah. is persistence because i have a voice you know what i mean it's not yeah. about oh if I do this and I become famous, then people will respect me. Or if I do this and then I'll be known as an artist or like, I'll be allowed to get into this thing or that thing. And it's like, no, I'm creating art. Cause I've got something to say with the art that I create. And it doesn't right. matter if it's a painting, a sculpture, a video, uh, an audiobook record. I do. I create motivational MP3s, right? Where I put like <laughs> nice soothing music and it's my voice telling myself like, you know what? You're a champion, man. <laughs> like <laughs> how ridiculous. But at the same time, I'm like, that shit's cool. Like yeah. I create this stuff because I like, I'm like my biggest fan. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that there's a reality in that where you create the things because you want to hear them back. Yes. You want to you want to look at this thing. You want to you have a voice and you're putting yeah. it out there and then that pride of creating it. And I think a lot of people try to create for an audience, right? That's that's the big thing right now. It, not even right now, but it's been the big thing where it's like when you're thinking about marketing, who's your audience? What do, what do they look like? Da 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 da, right? You're 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 looking around for a niche because it's a quick fix. Who's, mm-hmm. who's the audience. This is, this is really popular right now. So this is what I'm going to talk about. And in reality, you can't make that distinction because there's 8 billion people on the planet. And chances are that if you're creating some stuff that you really dig, mm-hmm. that you could sit there like a dork and just listen or look at your own stuff, read yeah. your own books, right? You're like, I love this book, you know? <laughs> Chances are there's somebody out there that loves that. 100%. 100%. And, and I think, I think what happens, it's, 
you know, having sort of that, that background in marketing and you see it, it's, it's, it's a little bit of how can we, and it's no knock on it, but it's just the way that things appear to be structured. It's like, how can we simplify it? And I love that, that number. It's like, we have 8 million people here, so I can't find a couple hundred thousand that are into many of these. Yeah. Like, can we, and I think we, we look for a way to try to have the machine do the work. You yeah. know, tell me about your, your, you know, your lookalike groups and all of that. It's like, I don't know, like, you, who's my audience? People who like listening to artists, people like listening to people who are creative, people who want to like get that sort of BTS approach as to what happens. People who like conversations. And yeah. I think when you start descri describing it in those terms, you talk to a marketing person, they look at you like you're out of your mind. I was like, I think I've simplified it. I think I've made it very simple. But who is it similar to? I don't, want, I don't want it to be similar to anybody or right. anything. I want it to be my own thing. And you, you can't make that distinction because, you know, when, when you're talking about marketing, to, the, the truth of the matter is that when you're, when mostly when you're talking about marketing, you're talking about demographics and a lot of the demographics are based on um, financial status. Mm. And really that's the reality of it, Right. In my marketing book, I talk about the different levels, you know, where they do the vowels and that you you figure out. And when you really break it down, you start realizing that like, so you're, you walk around and you look and if something is in the value section, that's for the needs driven, right? These are the people that like, they ain't got any cash. And then you've got people that jump on the bandwagon, right? Because they want to look like somebody Mm -hmm. who is of means, right? This perception that you have of somebody who is, so I'm going to buy, you know, and uh, growing up where I grew up in the ghetto, you'd see it all the time, right? People would save up money to buy the Nikes because they wanted to go to school wearing mm -hmm. the Nikes. And if it wasn't the Nikes, it was the Adidas crew and they hated each other. And it was like, that is <laughs> brilliant because like, basically you create a cult following mm -hmm. based on, these shoes that are made by the same manufacturers somewhere right. overseas. Like it's, it's, it's hilarious. And not, not knocking people that love their, their yeah. shoes because yeah. that's, that's part of the culture, but there are parts of the culture that don't exist, right. That aren't known yet because the Rob Lee culture is you. Yeah. And until you put that out there, and you share it in enough places where enough people see it and enough people are talking about it, right? And you're out there and you're out there and you're doing this and you're doing that and boom, 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 boom. And you can't be ignored because you're just putting it out there, right? Yeah. And, and genuinely, right? Not desperately trying like, I need attention. <laughs> hey, I need you to listen to this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on, listen man. Listen to this, please. Yeah. <laughs> like where you're genuinely putting it out there and you're not, you're just, you know what? I'm going to have as many conversations that, for somebody who was painfully shy. Right. Yeah. Right. It's like I could, I, I would shut down my, my knees would buckle. They would shake. Right. Putting myself out there doesn't just mean share your stuff out there as much as you can or whatever. Put mm -hmm. your stuff out there means get out there and mm -hmm. face that fear. Have that conversation. Reach out to that person. You yeah. know, do those things that are that you haven't been doing and they've been keeping you small, right? Mm -hmm. Don't seek validation. Don't look for validation. Don't jump through anybody's hoops to get upset, you know, accepted. I, I remember... I remember there was a, uh, a magazine had approached me about writing an article for them. And I was like, oh, that's cool. That's a great opportunity. And <clears throat> they were like, who's your favorite band? You know, and at the time I was like, oh, they might be giants. I love they might be giants. Right. Yeah. So like put them in, you know, write this article. Goes in the magazine. And they didn't promote anything that had to do with me mm -hmm. right and that was the whole deal of that article i was very very happy that i'm not great at spelling my books i've written books but like my wife clea has to like spell check that that thing because like i write how i talk which is not proper anything so like 
there's a, a magazine article that I actually have framed because I keep all that kind of stuff, right? I put it on a wall of fame so that when people walk in, they're like, oh, wow, you guys, you know. <laughs> so, like, I keep that stuff. There's an article out there that has a bunch of misspellings <laughs> that they didn't even double check and put out there. And that's the thing. It's like there's all kinds of things that people associate with validation, right? Oh, so you're a real artist if you get into a gallery. Mm -hmm. No, you know what you are? You're somebody who has to jump through hoops to yep. get into a gallery. I remember I got into a, I got into one of the galleries finally in Pensacola because when I first got there, they were like, nope, we don't know who you are. You're nobody. You got to, you know, we don't want to talk to you. And then eventually um, I built up a reputation just by doing what I what we were doing in town. And they approached me and they wanted me to join. And I remember being in this gallery and my wife's, you know, Clee's mom comes in. She's like, oh, you finally made it. At the time, I'm sitting there, right? Because I had been in there for like two months. And I was like, this is bull. Like, <laughs> I just, people are coming to this gallery to buy my art, right? And like, I'm paying them and spending time and doing stuff with them when they would buy that anyway. Right. No matter where I am. And realizing that one of the most powerful things you could do is get in a position where you don't need anyone else. And you could genuinely approach or, or be approached by somebody and be able to negotiate your own terms. Yeah. I feel, I feel the same way about the music industry. Why are you, everybody wants to get signed. I'm like, why do you want to get signed if you have no negotiating power? Yeah. Where's your leverage? <laughs> yeah. Why, why do you want to get published if you don't have negotiation? If you don't need the publishers, that's when you want to sign a publishing deal. If you don't need the record companies, that's when you want to sign because then you have leverage. Yeah. You can have a more advantageous sort of situation for yourself. And, you know, I ain't, I ain't counting that, you know, in, in doing this and, and, I, and I remark upon it where, you know, and it's, it's not one of these things where I'm gassing myself up, but, you know, people like to come on here. And in the beginning, I could I couldn't get 20 interviews. It was a challenge. And right. as soon as maybe having sort of a, you know, more of a captive and more of a like sort of a slowdown, it really started to take off. And people were like, oh, I would love to be on. I would love to be on. And that's during the beginning, like in, in, in 2022 of the pandemic and doing doing that. So people are home and we're doing these interviews and, you know. It's funny when I reach out to people, I try to schedule my 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 calendar to do interviews because I'll do 18 interviews in a week. And it's like, look, this is a lot. Right. I'm like, all right, I need this. I need to like do every 45 days. Here's the slots. Yeah. And people say, man, you're so busy. I was like, I'm always busy. I'm always like working on something and really adjusting it now to not chase sort of this validation thing or even something that smells like it. Because yeah. it's like you can do a lot of stuff, and I don't want to feel like this this thing that I'm working on this pod this podcast this brand this whole overarching thing. I don't want it to feel like it's been sullied somehow. It's yeah. now just me <clears throat> chasing whatever this thing is, and then the quality starts to go down, and then my enjoyment because that's the yeah. thing I'm doing it for out. myself, one hundred percent. So I, I want to. I want to go, I want to I want to ask this before I ask you about painting a little bit. Okay. Uh, so so we, we, as before we got into the aside because I think the side was very good and I think the side was very useful. Um, so you're you're leaving you you leave you know sort of this corporate job or what have you? Could you describe some of those feelings like leading up to that decision to quote unquote go rogue? So I um I was I was very very good at my job. No matter what job I had, I was very good at my job. Creatively, I think a lot of creative thinkers are very good at what they do, right? Um, because you get to, you're, you're divergent. You get to think a little bit outside of the box, and sometimes you're able to apply that in certain places. I um, was very good at what I did, and because I was very good at what I did, at one point, I um, I started to get asked to do things that I didn't agree with morally. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, and, and a lot of that when you're in a higher management position has to do with terminating people because you need to cut hours. Yeah. Um, and legally, in order for somebody not to collect unemployment, you have to have a certain process in which you terminate. You can't just fire somebody all willy nilly. It doesn't work that way, despite how the paperwork looks, right. you know. Um, and I was really good at that for years. I refused to do it. And then I got desperate. I needed, I needed more money. I was already making a lot of money, but I needed more money. Right. Um, because when you are working a job that you're not happy in, and I'm not saying that all jobs that people, there are people out there that enjoy their work and that's great. Yeah. You know, there, everybody's different. I did not. And when you do that, you end up buying and spending money on things that you think are going to bring you joy. And, you know, that's where we sort of associate money with happiness, that, that kind of thing. And so I needed more. <clears throat> and when you need more and you get desperate, you become really afraid of losing your job. Yes. And when you become afraid of losing your job, you walk around on eggshells and you will basically do whatever they ask you to do. I terminated someone that was one of my employees and she was fantastic. She was an amazing human being. I adored her, but I terminated her. I found a loophole in order to terminate her. The day that she got terminated, she didn't know she walked in and she was so excited because she had just bought her first car. Yeah. Things in her life had been kind of rough and they were finally coming around. And I had to tell her that she was fired. That crushed my soul. Right. It already been heading in that direction, but that crushed my soul so much that I could not do it anymore. It was one of those points where I could not do it anymore. And leaving my job meant that my life was going to fall apart everything you know and what what's interesting and I'll, I'll i'll leave out the the depression for a week thing and like all that all that sadness that comes in when you lose everything right everything starts falling apart so at that point i i had no job um i ended up i was going through a divorce right because i had no job and all the money in my bank account went somewhere else the house i was losing the house both of my cars broke down And, um, I had nothing, nothing left basically. And all based on this decision that I made, at least so I thought what I realized was all of that stuff that I was so afraid to lose. Basically what I was doing was I was doing this juggling act, working this job, trying to keep all that stuff intact, right? Here's my life. This is the life that I have And even though I don't enjoy it, I'm going to do whatever it takes to keep this life from falling apart. That means I got to make money. Money associates this life. Well, at that point, I lost everything. And so I basically, and this is not a a story that a lot of people find very popular when when I tell it, you know, especially people that are interviewing me. Um, I basically lost my mind, according to everyone else. Because for the first time in my life, I didn't care. And I wasn't worried. I was like, I already lost everything. <laughs> like, right. <laughs> Only up I from got, here. <laughs> yeah, I got nowhere to go from here. And they were like, well, you should be worried because of this and because of that. And I was like, you know what? I've been told throughout my whole life what I should be worried about. And I think I'm not going to worry anymore. You should be worried about money. You should be worried to pay your bills on time. You should be worried to do this. You should be worried to do that. You know, you should get to work on time. You should, you know, there's a lot of shoulds. You don't want to should yourself. Yeah. You don't want to should yourself, especially because people are usually shooting on you. So (laughs) (laughs) So like I got to a point where I was like, you know what? I'm done. Yeah. I'm done. I'm done with that old life. Like I grew up, you know, like I said, my family had a jewelry store. So from the age of 14, I was working, 
you know, before that I was delivering newspapers for one of the small uh, bodegas in the, in the neighborhood. And I've always had to work, yeah. right? Childhood, you know, people were going on summer vacations. I was working. And then I go, you know, leave the jewelry store. Cause I'm like, I want freedom. And then I go and work somewhere else and I'm working a corporate job and thinking that now I'm free because now I'm making real money. Right. It's not like family family payments or anything like that. It's like real money and understanding that like life is way too short mm -hmm. to do anything that doesn't add to your life. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you are either spending all your time investing your time and, and this is the important thing about this, right? And this was the realization that really made it for me, right? Money, despite what people think, money is not a finite resource, right? They're printing money all the time. Money is everywhere, you know? It, money just keeps coming. It comes, it goes, it comes and goes. Yeah. The, the finite resource is time. Mm -hmm. time we're not going to get more time. And that's the realization where I was like, you know what? I am done. I'm done with this. Right. And I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what it is that I'm supposed to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. And ironically, I didn't know what to do because <laughs> I've been told, you know, my whole life I've been told what to do. You work for somebody like it's pretty straightforward. You go in, you do your job, you go home, you know, I, in fact, for the most part, I didn't know what to do with myself when I wasn't at work. Right. And that's where it's like, Hey, you want to go to the bar? You know, like it was, yeah. you just filling in time. I'm going to start working out, you know, like whatever you're, you're <laughs> there, there's, there's so many things that, you, you have the opportunity to do and you're like, what am I using my time for? You're, you're trying to flake even now to a degree when I take a day off, if I'm not like to my ears in work and stuff to do, I'm like, man, I'm not, this, something's off. What's wrong here? It's like, <laughs> I need to be like so busy that I can't breathe sometimes. And that, that doesn't really work. And I, I like, sometimes I romanticize, right. When I see, like I like a lot of stand up comedy. And when I yeah. hear about like how comedians go about, man, I'm just in the hotel until like nine when I got my set. I like that. I like that idea. But I feel like, you know, because I'm in these sort of two worlds blade, if you will, I, yeah. I, I you know, I feel like it feels it's a little bit of guilt there in doing sort of both. But one and I think this this goes to what you touched on earlier. The, the thing that I think that fills my soul doesn't break my soul you know, Beyonce, uh, is really like being able to kind of make my own way and really just kind of bet on myself in that sort of way. So yeah. if I'm doing a series of interviews with folks or I'm deciding to do something because I think it's interesting creatively, or I think it has some relevance or I'm just interested in it. I yeah. like being able to answer to myself versus having to answer, answer to some sort of gatekeeper or what have you. Exactly. And that's, that's, that's where the that's where the validation comes in, because, you know, I didn't know what to do with myself and then decided that, like, all right, I've got an old 92 Ford Explorer. Uh, I'm going to travel the country. I've got no yeah. money, no income. Right. I, I think at that point, somehow <laughs> through who knows what some <laughs> some settlement check or something that came in, I had like 400 bucks uh, yeah. in my pocket and. I was like, yeah, I'm going to travel. And everybody was like, what do you mean you're going to travel? And then Clee was like, yeah, I'm going to come with you. Right. Yeah. She quits her job. And I take some of that money and renovate the Explorer and turn it into a home, basically, with a rollaway bed and cabinets and whatnot. And we traveled for two years. Right. And I did this because I knew that I needed to break myself out of the habit. Mm hmm of needing to have things a certain way, right? Because you get so used to, I got to work, 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 work. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. And the fact of the matter is like, I work a lot right now, yeah. but what am I doing? You know, I'm editing video. I'm filming some stuff. Uh, we're playing music. I'm in a studio painting, you know, yeah. it's hours go by 
And it's like, oh shit, we haven't even gone outside or done anything. Like, it's like, oh, we, I, I forgot to eat today. You know, having conversations yeah. with you. I'm like, this is my life. You know, yeah, it's, and it's, it's, it's easy to forget yeah. how awesome it is when you're in the thick of it. Mm -hmm. Because you kind of take those old habits with you. You know, when you're sitting mm -hmm. at work and you're like, God, this place sucks. <laughs> and, and, regularly <laughs> and it's and it's funny because those those are just habits right so yeah. even something you love you're going to turn into work and that's what i realized being out on the road doing what we do even all these years later like i gotta watch myself because i will go in the studio humble brag about some commission i got oh, yeah i gotta work on this commission <laughs> Oh, I only got like a week left and then make it misery. Right. When I love what I do. Right. You know, so it's like, it's making that distinction. I think we, we all have that, that place in our mind where we think that work is supposed to suck. So if you mm -hmm. do something for a living and God forbid that you actually make some money with this thing that you love doing now, yeah. now your habits are really going to turn it into some crap that you hate. So us, it's office space. Yeah, That's exactly. <laughs> exactly. So us hitting the road was a testament to like, I need to break these habits. A, I need to break the habit of having a consistent paycheck every week. Right. Cause I, I will tell you right now, I was like an addict feeding for that. I was like, I will do whatever, you know, like it was, it was, it was bad. It's bad. We get so yeah. used to it. It's like, this is consistent. This is security. And it's like, there ain't no security in that. It's like that study with the mouse or that rat or what have you. It's like, oh, here's the cocaine that you want. Yeah, it's like, exactly. Ah, nice. Exactly. <laughs> and so like, you're like, oh, I got to, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And your brain goes into this quick thing that, that brains aren't supposed to do. You, brains are not designed to figure out how to solve a problem before the problem happens. You know, yeah. it's, we, we are, we suck at predicting outcomes. That's, that's not what we're designed. We're designed to hindsight. Oh shit, this went wrong. All right, I'm not going to do this again. But you can't, where am I going to get this money? How are we going to pay for this? Oh my God, the phone bill is due. Are, are, and you're just taken up by all this stuff. And the irony is that when you go into that place, right? Because mm -hmm. we're not running right away from lions and stuff, you know, your body goes into fight or flight. Yes, 100%. Your body goes into fight or flight. And you know what happens when your body goes into fight or flight? Your frontal lobe shuts down because you are meant to either scratch and fight or run. You're not meant to think. So you get really dumb and you make really dumb financial decisions because you're already stressed out that you can't pay your bills. So being on the road, it was like, all right, <clears throat> this is life or death, right? We're, we're on the road. Like yeah. there is no, we're not staying at somebody's house that we know or anything like we are just driving out there and who knows what's going to happen. And we got 400 bucks and who knows what's going to happen. And very quickly, what we realized was if you stress out, shit gets worse. Mm -hmm. Right. So we spent two years on the road and essentially it was like, all right, not Pollyanna, um, stick your head in the ground. Or, you know, it's not, it's not like that. It's not like think positive thoughts and then you'll be okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You should be thinking yeah. positive, but you also should be thinking, well, what if this shit happens and it doesn't work out? Yeah. What if, what if it falls apart? Right. Think about it. What if it falls apart? What am I going to do then? Who do I want to be then? What if I don't get into that art show? What if I don't have the money to pay my bills, right? What if I don't, what if I can't pay my mortgage? What if I can't do this? What if I can't do that? People catastrophize. You still, you got to show yourself that you're still in control of your emotions and be like, well, fuck it. I won't pay my, you know, what, what's the gas company going to do? Shut off my gas? Can't do that yeah. in winter. I mean, every, every now and again, every now and again, I'm able to connect to that and and that's a thing that's that's really like big and it's it comes from my dad a little bit like he's a dude that will not pay a bill he's like ah. <laughs> and 
I love and, it. And I kind of take I t- kind of take a piece of that. It was like <laughs> there's some degree of responsibility here, but also <laughs> it's, it's kind of like this sort of thing. And, and shout out to Dad, but you know, it's one of those things where it's just like. He would say, like, eh, if they can't find me, they can't charge me. I'm like, you know what? There's something in that to, to take from it, because as a person that and, you know, and we'll wrap it because I got some I got some rapid fire questions for you. I want to ask okay. you, um, but I, I definitely relate, like, you know, kind of going back through it, um, you know, super shy. You know, I, I do the override thing. Um, it's like I get stage fright, incredible stage fright. And then it's like, oh, Rob, you're on the stage. And I was like, oh, Ooh. and but sometimes I'm able to do this sort of override. And my partner is always surprised. She was just like, you don't you know, you're not really you know, you're, you don't really look for you're not the the extrovert or present yourself as extrovert, all of that. You're kind of like you'll do your own thing. But then there's sort of this performance thing. I was like, oh, yeah, because it's contrived. I was like, oh, I'm able to separate these things. And this is sort of this public thing. And if I have a conversation with someone that is as long like this one as the the podcast, then there's actually what the real person is in that, not sort of, hey, let's do this and let's get to these questions and so on. There's a degree of contrivance there where... You know, I sent you the questions beforehand. You have a sense of what we're probably going to talk about and so on. But, you know, there's always sort of this using one's taste, using one's direction to say, let's take the questions this way. Let's take the conversation in this way, because I think it's something to be gained from that. Sure, we can sit here and talk about. So your process when you're stroking the brush. It's a real conversation. I mean, and that's the thing, like as humans, that's that's what we like. It's a storytelling yeah. when you when somebody's telling you a story about something, right? And then they go off on a tangent on something else, and then they eventually return back to the story. It's like two hours go by, and you've had a great time. If yeah. somebody is sitting, and I've Rob, I, I will tell you right now, this is great because I've been in interviews <laughs> where they're like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and you could tell that they're not even paying attention because they're thinking <laughs> about the question that they need to get to. By the end of the podcast or the end of the interview. And I'm like, dude, we're not even having a, you're just throwing questions at me and we're not even talking about them. Like duck this one. Yeah, exactly. It's like, (laughs) tell me about a time when (laughs) I'll be like, yeah, you know, and then I left the corporate. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. So, um, what do you like painting? I'm like, that has nothing to do with what I just (laughs) talked about for the last half hour. So <laughs> I'm burying my soul here, you guys. It's like, what are you, what are we doing here? No, 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 absolutely. And, and, and thank you. I think it's, it's important to be able to just have sort of those conversations. Cause I think it's, it's more than just the, the typical thing you, you want to hear about the thinking that goes into it, yeah. you know, like what, what, what makes, what makes it up at the end of the day is like this sort of experience that you've had that, you know, we kind of motivated you to go rogue in some ways. And some of the experiences you had in traveling, that's going to show up in your work and how you approach your work. And it, it, it's, it comes from everywhere. Like everything that I create, whether it's the books or the artwork or stuff like that has to do with the experiences that I've had, you know, being on the road, throwing yourself out there, getting started, you know, in Pensacola in a new town where we didn't, yeah. th- we just moved there to help my dad through his heart surgery. And we were like, all right, you know, and then getting started at the flea market, you're not supposed to start your art career at the flea market. You know, <laughs> don't you know anything? <laughs> and, I, I, and I got to the point where I was like, you know what? pretty much everything, every rule, whether it's in art or in this or whatever, it's all bullshit. It's all just somebody made it up and a bunch of people agreed and then they started repeating it. And then next thing you know, it became a rule. And I was like, so that means that's where going rogue comes from. Cause I was like, I'm going to fucking, I'm just going to do my own thing because it's all made up anyway. Everybody's guessing. People are going to tell you, like, this is what you need to do in order to make your art career happen. It's like they don't know. Yeah. They don't know what to do yeah. to make their art career happen, let alone know what to do to make your art career happen. When you're a completely you're in a different place in life, you have different things that you like. There are things that you love. You got to you got to dig in there and get to that place where you find out more about yourself and really that's the essence of putting yourself out there and going rogue is figuring out like, Hey, why are you so scared about missing, not paying your bills? Yeah. What's going to happen to you? Are you going to burst into flames? 
You know, like, is that, is that the end? And, and it's like with all the shit that has happened in my life, right? Yeah. I'm still here. I'm still here to have to deal with the, whatever the new, the nuisances are, whatever the stresses, whatever humble brags and me procrastinating uh-huh. is all, all of that different stuff. And, you know, sometimes having a person that's with you partner and, and, and they kind of get it. Like you haven't cleaned me, having my, my partner and, you know, just having someone that's like, I'm here, I'm in it. I get it. Yeah. And that's really, really important. And, you know, my partner reminds me all the time. She's like, I remember when you were having trouble getting guests. Now you're talking to these people and you have other cities, arts districts flying you down to talk to their artists. Yep. She's like, that's like in less than four years, really. Yeah. She's like, so which is a big she's deal. Like, <laughs> she's like, she's like, look at it that way. She's like, I know you want more. And she was like, it's not going to be easy. You're, you're, you know, six foot four black guy that's talking to artists. And it's like, oh, you're not supposed to be here. <laughs> so she, it, it's really funny and giving me sort of that context. And it's like, because she knows that's what I'm thinking in the back of my head anyway. Yeah. But it's like having, because she's super small, having like a tiny angel and double, <laughs> like of the same person, just telling you, like, you know, this is all bullshit, right? Yeah. So, so let, let me, um, I want to hit you with, um, in these last moments here, I want to hit you with, I got four rapid fire questions okay. and then, um, just shameless plugs and we'll wrap there because really didn't talk about books or anything along those lines. So definitely want to send folks to the website. Um, so as a fellow shy person, right. What is your go-to conversation starter? Like, how do you <laughs> get into a conversation when you're looking like, ah, I got to talk to this person. Hey, man, how's the weather? So um, so basically, I've spent the last few years, I, I am a shy person, but I am also somebody who has stage fright and will book a show <laughs> playing music just because I don't like not being in control of my own emotions. You know what I mean? Got you. And so I love challenging myself by going up to people and asking them weird shit. (laughs) You know, go on. So like, you know, (laughs) you go, you go up to somebody and you're like, you know, I mean, a lot of it's not really weird shit, but it's just not typical stuff. Cause a lot of times it's like, so what do you do? You know, like, you know, a question like that. I always love the response as well because people will come up to you and they'll be like what do you do for a living and uh i like to say that i'm an ambassador of joy you know which is great yeah i'm an ambassador of joy um asking somebody some of the questions that i've asked somebody when i go up to them usually has to do with when we're at an art show or something so i'll do this weird thing which well, it's going to sound creepy out of context, <laughs> but like, you know, I do a lot of trees in my painting. So I'll go up to them and I'll be like, what's up? You like my trees? <laughs> <You know? laughs> but it's, it's just, it's a little creepy. I think, yeah, it is. It is creepy, but it's just being willing. I think because I didn't have a voice for so long, mm-hmm. I think the first thing that pops into my head is what I talk about. And the last thing that I want, I've literally, I literally will walk away from a conversation, which is not something that I've ever done in my life, you know, because I'm a people pleaser. So it's like, I'll stay there. I'll be like, this sucks so bad. I've gotten (laughs) to the point, Klee's still working on it. So a lot of times Klee ends up being stuck there in the conversation as I would just walk away. (laughs) It's like the Cuban goodbye. Yeah, exactly. It is the Cuban goodbye. I'll be like, it's. I'll be like, yeah, okay, thank you. And then I'll walk away. And then Cleo will look at me like, what have you done? <laughs> I did the same thing. I'm just like, I'm just going to get over here. And it's, it's hard for me to hide, too, because it's like, <laughs> yo, you take up a lot of space, sir. And it's like, you're not fitting behind that tree. You know, you're taking it back to the trees. Um, So here, here, here's the next one. Um, On average, how many hours of sleep do you get? Uh, I don't know. It varies. I... <sighs> That's a hard question. You get an average of six hours. Six hours. Same. Six hours. And then there are moments where next thing you know, I'm like, holy shit, I slept in. You know, I'll have like maybe every few months, like I just pass out and don't get out of bed. Apparently my body just catching up. Yeah, that that happens. That happens. Uh, Dogs or cats? 
Oh man, I like them both. I don't want them. That's that's a fair <laughs> that's a fair answer. I mean, my my partner has like three cats and a dog now and uh empty nest so it's kind of like that situation yeah. but the dog is like 90 pounds and the cat or 100 <laughs> and the cat is like a rag doll who we think is a dick and he, he's the cutest animal but also he's a prick so it's like mean, why are you this i mean that's the thing it's like understanding that it's not a comparison because cats are absolute dicks and dogs <laughs> are just kind of dumb they're dumb asses who are like really all hard all the, no brains yeah yeah it's so it's like and then they're all happy to see you like i just left I, I'm coming back for my keys. Like, oh my God, you're back. You know, and the cat's looking at you like, why are you even here in the first place? You know? Like, wish you locked yourself up. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, but I think, you know, I think they're awesome. Now, Clea and I don't have pets because, you know, we travel and we do things. Right. And I don't know. It's, I, me surviving is enough of a responsibility for me than keeping, trying to keep something alive. That's great. <laughs> here's the last one here's the last one um and and, and I, I want the nerdiest answer possible um what fictional world or place would you like to visit oh man well right now it would be star trek because it's strange new worlds that's what we're watching right now nice. but last week oh, yeah. it would have been the expanse <laughs> okay and then you know there's star wars and then as far as like fantasy lands i love jim butcher like the harry dresden the dresden files so like i'd be in <laughs> chicago but it would be set in like you know the magical world i don't know i i yeah yeah i'm i'm i am a movie buff but i'm also a fantasy and sci-fi buff i mean here's an example I was looking at that the entire time. What was in the box? Yeah. So a friend of mine who is an artist in um, Washington uh, created this for me. Nice. Right. To go with the planets that he hand painted for us. He created that. And then here, I'll just show you Jupiter. Wow. That is gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. This is hand painted. Wow. He is an amazing, amazing sci-fi artist. Um, and so like he he gave me this. We bought this, but he gave me this. So this is gonna go hanging in my writing room where I could <laughs> totally nerd out. I love it. So um that's pretty much it for the questions that I had in in this this final moment here. Anything that you want to say as we wrap up? And I already have my closeout stuff done. So it's just like the final words are for you. So what anything you have in the final moments, the floor is yours. So the final countdown is <laughs> um oh man, now I got the sun. I can't okay. All right. <laughs> you did it to yourself. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I would say that the final thing, if there's anything, and it's one thing that I love to leave everybody on is don't jump through hoops because you don't have to right if you're going out there looking for validation because you want to be this or that or perfect or worthy or whatever it is you don't need to do that because you know you're pretty damn awesome as yourself and nobody is going to be as awesome at being you as you so you might as well just be yourself instead of trying to be like somebody else and fit some kind of mold that exists and just go out there and do it your way. And if anybody doesn't agree with you, you know, F them. Right. <laughs> so Literally. I, at the end of the day, that's, you know, but my level of advice, I mean, and you've read, you've read the book. So like, you know, that pretty much my advice could be condensed down to do what you want to do in your life. Don't look for validation and don't let anybody tell you what to do and just persist through it and take that opportunity to understand that every roadblock that you're going to run into it's all in your head you know yeah. yeah it's in in your face but the reason you're feeling all sad and distraught is because it's you know it means something to you that you could change and be like fuck it like you know i'm not going to pay that bill your dad's on to something there you know they can't find what are they gonna do <laughs> hey, we've had That's... those conversations and like you were saying earlier like with with clee like where clee will be like yeah you know like whatever i'm like what are they gonna do you know <laughs> it's, it's really funny <laughs> so 
that's that's pretty much it. I want to thank you, Rafi, for coming on. This has been a treat. This thank, is just thank, great. Thank you. This was this was really cool. And I hope I hope we uh, you know, I would love to do this again with you sometime. Absolutely. Um, not you know, even <laughs> if it's not being recorded for a podcast. So this was <laughs> this was really cool and I I absolutely enjoyed it. And there you have it, folks. I want to again thank Rafi Perez for coming on. Rogue artist, rogue artist, rogue artist. And I'm Rob Lee um, saying that there's art and culture in and around your neck of the woods. You just got to look for it. Oh, 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 oh